Welcome back to the main stage of Austria Comic Con 2024. And for this panel, we have a very special guest who does not act in front of the camera, but behind it to create the things that we then get to see and enjoy. Ladies and gentlemen, give a warm Austria Comic Con welcome applause for Brian Muir. Here you go. It's so, so absolutely magical to meet the people responsible for all these illusions, effects, and, and moments that we enjoy so much. So, um, when you got to start to work on your project, what was your main inspiration that told you, okay, I need to do this, I want to make a career out of this? Uh, well, at the very start, I was about 13 and I'd never really been into art, but I discovered that I could draw and I could paint. Mm -hmm. And by the end of, uh, I spent a lot of time in the art room um, drawing and painting. And then when I finished school, I said to my mother, um, I'd like to do something with art. And she said, I know someone down the youth employment, I'll, I'll, I'll ask her. And it so happened that they were wanting an apprentice sculptor mm -hmm. at Elstree Film Studios. There'd never been one before. And the woman said to me, they've turned down 12 already, so don't hope to get the job too much. It probably <laughs> won't happen. Mm -hmm. But I went in for an interview at Elstree Studios um, got on quite well with the old guy that was going to be um, uh, training me and was the only sculptor there. And uh, he took a shine to me and a week later I got a letter drop on uh, our doormat saying you got the job as an apprentice sculptor. <laughs> so at 16 I was a professional sculptor <laughs> in the film industry. Do you still remember the very first piece that you laid hands on? For, that, that we can see in a film or a TV series production? The very first thing that was on screen, and that was a few min months after I started at Elstree, we went on uh, loan up to MGM Studios, mm -hmm. and there was a film there called Captain Nemo, and I did some big shells, about so, so big, um, and they had several of them around this swimming pool, and I helped the old guy train under, there was a big figure that spewed out gold. And so that was the first time that I worked on a film that um, work of mine was shown on. Yep. And then in the four years I was there, they did hammer horror films, small British films, um, The Avengers and the same television mm -hmm. um, programs at that time, although they have made films since. Um, and I, I suggested, actually, the day I came out my apprenticeship, the, the studios were in such a mess, no films being made, that I was made redundant the day I finished my apprenticeship. And I thought, well, that's it. I, I'm not going to work in the film industry again. But um, I managed to get a job up in London. And uh, at the age of 20, I'd work unveiled by the Queen of England, which is a, a real privilege at that age to have that happen for you. It was a job for the New Stock Exchange up in London, and I did a panel uh, that had the Bank of England with all the tiny details of that on, the Royal Exchange, the Old Stock Exchange, and then the New Stock Exchange on this panel, and it was mm -hmm. done in bronze. So, yeah, it was quite a, quite a thing. Actually, I was, I was sitting outside the Royal Exchange doing a sketch of it all, and people would come past and wonder what the hell I was drawing. And no one actually said, what are you doing? But I, I saw them all lo looking. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I, I had lots of um, prestigious um, jobs to do there, all, all, all up around London. A church had a fire, so I had to do wood carving with that. All the oak um, pieces that were up in the church, I had to re-carve them all which was quite, quite a nice job to do. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I did at college when I was an apprentice. I, I actually studied wood carving and did wood carving. 
So it put me in good stead to do all this really nice work when I'd finished mm -hmm. um, and went out there. But as I said yesterday, at the age of 23, I had a, ph a phone call from the old guy I worked under and they had a sci-fi film going into Elstree. And I think you can probably all guess what that film was. <laughs> in fact, there's one of the characters. That <laughs> <laughs> But be yeah. before we go to Star Wars, there is one thing I would like to, to, to quickly pause because obviously not everything that has ever been done on movies is in the IMDb. And you mentioned you work in, uh, with Hammer. And I love the old Hammer film productions, especially for the gothic atmosphere, for the wonderful sets and, and pieces. Can you elaborate a little bit on which films for Hammer you worked on and what you did there? If I'm honest, I can't remember any of them. Okay. It, it was, I mean, I can remember other films. There was a film called Digby, the, dog, the Biggest Dog, and we did a great big cucumber for that, and The Inside of the Mouth. Um, but Hammer films, they were all very low production uh, costs. They, um, they had a small budget, so they didn't have a lot of sculpting work. Mm -hmm. And at that time, the studios had what they call a stockroom, where they'd have um, uh, pieces of sculpture in there that a film with no budget could come in and use. Yes. So there wasn't many pieces uh, done and it was normally architectural work. Mm -hmm. So there's not a lot of consequence but Hammer uh, were based at Elstree Studios so all their films were made there. Mm -hmm. um, Dracula and uh, Frankenstein and all those sorts of movies. Over the four years I was there, mm -hmm. and I think they more or less packed up then, Hammer. Yeah, I think they went to Bray Studios, something. I, I don't know any, everything by heart. But Hammer is amazing, but I think when you're working with Hammer after they made Dracula, you know, okay, this is going to be, it's a small budget film, but it's going to get an audience. I think when you worked on Alien and saw the sketches and the designs from, from HR Giga, I think you must have thought, yes, this is going to be big. This, this is going to be a huge production and a big success. But when you walked on the set of Star Wars and started working on this small independent film, and I've talked to many people, um, and big producers were completely overwhelmed. Nobody expected it to blow up as big as it did. And what I want to go to is when you started working on the Vader helmet, on the Stormtrooper costume, did you have any idea of how iconic these designs, <laughs> these suits are going to become? Absolutely no idea whatsoever. In fact, most of the crew thought it wasn't going to be a good film, but was we proved wrong a year later when we went up to see the crew showing up in London, in Leicester Square. I mean, you see that great big spaceship coming over and it got a little round of applause, but at the end of the film, this same pessimistic crew that didn't think it was going to be good, it got a standing ovation we all realized that we'd worked on a film that was so far ahead of its time. Um, the effects that I, ILM on all the model stuff they did out there, all the main filming was done back in England and they went out to Tunisia <laughs> um, on location and a few other locations. But yeah, most of the main, main films made there, although there are a lot of uh, people that think that Star Wars was made in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. But as we say, no, it wasn't Hollywood, it was Borenwood. <laughs> because that's where Elstree Studios are. Back in the day when it first opened, Borenwood was a small, smaller place and Elstree was the bigger mm -hmm. area. So they called the studios Elstree, but it's really in Borenwood. Yeah. And I know the next question is a little bit mean, but I still like to ask it, if you could, turn back time and go back to working on these costumes and you had the chance to change one thing, what would it be? Uh, I don't know that I'd change anything because the costumes have become so iconic mm. that it would be arrogant of me to say I would change anything. Um, 
I suppose when doing the actual costume, you might have thought, well, I'd make that slightly different, but certainly now that it's become so established and iconic and, and such a known piece, and all around the world, we, we've traveled now, even to places like China, and Vader is so known that even if you put a silhouette up of Vader, I think most people would know what character it yep. is. Um, and the stormtroopers are pretty iconic as well. Yes, especially their aiming, which is very good because I, if I start shit talking them now, I know they ain't gonna hit me. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> he won't. You, you don't have to worry. He won't hit you. <laughs> But um, there will be something that should be hit. Um, hidden in the middle of the aisle is a audience microphone. So if there are questions that you would like Brian to answer for you, please just approach the mic and ask your question. Gibt es Fragen vom Publikum? Dann könnt ihr jederzeit zum Publikums Mikro. If not, I'll continue. Um, you started on the Veda mask with a reference artwork that was drawn by Ralph McQuarrie, by Norman Reynolds, and by John Mollo. And then you took the sketches and turned them into the, the helmet. Can you tell us something about the process, about the materials that you used for this, and what your favorite materials to use are? Well, in that case, it was clay that I, that I sculpted Vader and the Stormtroopers in. Uh, the process was, uh, Dave Prowse was going to play the part of Ray, uh, Vader, so they moulded him and life cast him and actually cast him in plaster. So in front of me, I had a, a plaster Dave Prowse. So initially, to do the mask and the helmet, I cut it off at the shoulder and put it on a sculpting stand. So it was at a decent height for me to work on. And then it was clay that I sculpted Vader's form on top from a small drawing about so big that was just a simple line drawing from one angle. Because when you sculpt, it has to be done 360 degrees, not one angle. Yep. Um, so a lot of the design was done in the sculpting um, with John Barry, the designer on the film, who has the overall say on all the sets and everything else. But George Lucas was really hands-on as a director. It was really his pet project. And he actually came up to see the Stormtroopers and Vader, and he, he liked them. And time was, so, uh, time was so tight on it that, um, in a way, it was a matter of having to like it. <laughs> And people say, how many goes did I get a Vader? Well, there's only one. That's all there was time for. Um, so, yeah, it, it was a nice film to work on. Um, I was on it for four months. Um, there was one period of time I worked for 76 days without a day off. <laughs> so when the end of the picture came, I was really tired. And I, although it was disappointing to finish on the film, I was glad to get a rest after that. Yeah. But it wasn't for long, about a week after I started on a film, a war film called The Eagles Landed. And um, they were filming in a little place called Maple Durham in England, right on the River Thames. And in the church there was the Lord of the Manor and his wife. And then they were going to be using explosives mm -hmm. to blow the, the church up in a way and they obviously couldn't do that so we had to re reproduce the interior of the church so I had these figures to sculpt and I was working in a marquee in the middle of a field in this little place called Maple Durham to, to reproduce these figures and they um, re reproduced the inside of the church in, in, in a film but yeah that was quite a nice job to do before I went off to work in Budapest on a film called um, Prince and the Pauper mm -hmm. with Oliver Reed, Charlton Heston and some well-known actors in it. I'll tell you something that I don't think we've got some young people know. We was in a, a hotel called the uh, Gelliot Hotel in Budapest, beautiful old um, hotel. And it was Mark Lester who had been in the film Oliver. Mm -hmm. 
And funny enough, um, Oliver Reed was in that, and he played um, Bill Sykes with the Bull Terrier, a horrible natured character. And he, he was out there, but on um, Mark Lester's 18th birthday, his girlfriend came out to be with him. And we were up in this really lovely restaurant, they had an orchestra playing, where they set a long table out for us. So in walks Oliver Reed with a prostitute on his arm for um, Mark Lester's 18th birthday. <laughs> he, That's well, such he, an Oliver Reed thing to do. Yes, very much. Um, <laughs> but he was kicked out the hotel the following day, <laughs> not to be seen again in that hotel anyway. But um, yeah, I mean, Mark Lester was very embarrassed and his girlfriend as well. And many years. <laughs> and his girlfriend. Yeah. Was, she, was she at least there? Oh, to see when I yeah, oh yeah <laughs> she, was, she was sitting next to Mark Lester and yeah I mean it was such a weird thing to do only Oliver Reed would probably think of doing it um, but yeah that that was I mean it, um, Budapest is a lo lovely city and it was great to be there um, but there are so many I, there are I try and hit a few films that we didn't uh, yesterday there's uh, the film Crow Mm -hmm. It's quite a cult film now, and a lot of people like seeing it. And when I, when I first went on to the picture, they had this idea they were going to have this 70-foot snake mm -hmm. that I was going to have to sculpt. Um, it, the, I sculpted the snake one inch to the foot, so I did a 70-inch snake with a woman that was in the curls uh, coming out and leaning back. And the idea being is that the, um, the guy that was playing the lead part is walking up through the mountains and he hears his screaming coming from within a cave. And he goes in there and the woman who's in there screaming, all of, as he gets closer, she comes up out of the snake and she is the snake. <laughs> so I was going to have two marquees mm -hmm. end to end to do, sculpt this 70 foot snake. It would have been about three foot wide. And then it worked out that the, the, um, the price that the spe special effects put in to do all the work they would have to do was so much that they cut the, mm -hmm. cut the sequence out. Um, but there was lots of lovely work to do on Kroll. Um, there was a huge eye that you see the actress in that was painted um, like an ochre mm -hmm. um, that was, had to be sculpted um, and so much uh, other work. They got me to do a, a, a baby pig, actually, with the idea that the magician turns, turns um, people into certain animals and the like, and he turns someone into this little pig. So I had to sculpt this um, baby pig with the idea that they would use it, but obviously it didn't work. You couldn't really make a sculpted pig look life uh, life like enough mm -hmm. so they used a real one in the film yeah and also you can eat the sculpture yeah. afterwards yeah. <laughs> yeah i mean there was many other things i t I, I touched on uh, yesterday i mean the uh the shark that i did that jaws in yes. one of the bomb films uh, um i sculpted the eight foot tiger shark for that that he wrestles with in the shark tank that was quite a nice scene actually because Bond, there's a great big uh, magnet overhead and Jaws is under it and uh, the Bond turns the magnet on and pulls mm -hmm. up uh, Jaws by his teeth, he, he moves it over and it drops it in the tank and then he, he fights with the uh, shark in there. And it would have been lovely to see him fighting with a real <laughs> shark but uh, the production weren't going to have that one so... I would have loved to be a little mouse in the room when they tell that Richard Keel, <laughs> say, you are going to do that, and like, yeah. no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I talked about yesterday, but um, the 14 foot python in, in India, Alex yes. Jones and the Temple of Doom, I, I sculpt that mm -hmm. because um, the main actress was terrified, Cape Capsule was terrified of uh, snakes. So I did that, and you see it sliver down the tree, uh, the tree. She's sitting with her head against the tree, and it lands, comes onto her shoulder, and she sees it, grabs it, and throws it. But if you stop where we have, actually stopped the film at that point, you can see that it's a lifeless snake. But the um, special effects got quite nice movement, the way it was slithering down the tree. 
but uh, just another one of the jobs you get to do. <laughs> Let me quickly ask you, because we have about 15 minutes left, um, do you want to show us something that you brought, or do you want to continue talking? Uh, we'll carry on talking. Let's carry on talking. Great, because what I always love to do is also spotlight and talk about things and projects that maybe don't get talked about as much. But for instance, I really like Link, the Butler Ape movie from uh, 1986 that you also worked on. Do you remember? The, the, the in, in German, it's called Link der Butler. It's a little oh, horror movie. Link the, the monkey. Yes. That, yeah, that was made at Shepton Film Studios. And I didn't have anything to do with the monkeys or anything on that. I just, there was a passage going from the house and it was like a, a, a cave. So that's all I did on it. I did okay. some, uh, what I call bread and butter work. It's film that you go and earn the living, but you don't really enjoy doing. Um, so it's just, it, it pays the mortgage and keeps your family in clothes and food. And if mm -hmm. you're a professional, if you want to work all the time, you have to be prepared to do whatever works yes. offered. Um, I've been lucky throughout my career. I've had so much lovely work to do, but occasionally you get a, a little film like that that just wants a bit of rock work done, so you, uh, but you still do it. And you worked on Mortal Kombat 1995 under the direction of Paul W.S. Anderson, the video game. Yeah, uh, funny enough you asking that. <laughs> funny you asking that. It was the same sort of thing. It was a great big um, yep. a, a rock set. Um, funny enough, that was made at what is now the Warner Studios. And the first film to go into that studios was a Bond movie. Mm -hmm. And it was Goldeneye that had all the big Russian statues mm -hmm. on it. That I, I We started. talked about those yeah, yesterday, yes. We talked about them yesterday. And Mortal Kombat wasn't too long after that. It went in and I, I worked on that. Another film I worked on there was... I can't think of the name now, but um, I did maybe, a, maybe Cutthroat Island. That was around the same time. Were there any Harlan and no Cutthroat no. Island? That was out in Malta. I went out in Malta um, the same? to do work for on the ships. Uh. Funny enough, Oliver Reed was out there at the same time, and he was working on um, I think it was Gladiator. He was oh. working mm -hmm. on, and they were setting up for Popeye. Mm -hmm. And they have still got the um, set for Popeye over in Malta, yep. where the um, tourists can go and come and pay to walk around it. But um, yeah, so Cutthroat Island, and I only went out there to work on that for one month. I had free between doing um, the Loch Ness monster film with mm -hmm. Ted Danson in. Um, I was doing that. I'd, I'd carved it all and uh, there was a month gap so it was all over at Pinewood mm -hmm. I went out to Malta for a month and came back to fix all all the work we've done on on stage on on the Loch Ness Monster um, which was a smallish production I think a little less expensive than just using the real one yeah. <laughs> and uh, funny enough, it was Henson's that did the Loch Ness Monster, because you see the head there. Cool. Um, and I think that, that cost quite a lot of money. It was about half a million just to produce yep. the Loch Ness Monster head. And obviously it moved and that. But it was pretty good. And for the final thing, because it's a huge franchise and we have not touched it yet in, in the panels, you worked on Harry Potter. I did. I worked on four Harry Potter films, but the one I enjoyed most was The Order of the Phoenix. Mm -hmm. And um, funny enough, the work that, I, that some of the work that I did on that is still is in the museum they've created now, mm -hmm. uh, where they walked through to the Ministry of Magic. There are these really ornate fireplaces, about 17 foot high, and they walked through the middle. Mm -hmm. and walked down a corridor, there were 17 of these fireplaces. Well, I did all that on eight work. Then you go into the main hall and you have a huge centaur, a female figure, a goblin, which I, I did that. 
And then also on that set, you have these serpents that were I did in clay and they moulded and cast them and painted them to, to look like bronze. Um, and then there was, as you go into the lift to uh, go up into the ministry, there was these really ornate golden gates. And um, I spent a while, well, they got real metal gates made and I did all this detail that they applied afterwards, painted it all gold so it looked like it was all one and then they didn't shoot on it <coughs> uh, and it happens in the film industry you can do work that's not shot on yep. other times you'll do work that's in the background and the focus is on the actor yep. so although you see that work in the background you never see it that clearly but it's what goes to make a, a set or on a film be believable so if it's a um, a castle, it's a palace with all really ornate work on it. it be, you believe it's that. You believe it's a palace. You think it's out in India or wherever and not in Pinewood Studios. A bit like Octopussy, the Octopussy bed, all the ornate work above it, and the, t uh, the tanks with the tiny octopi in. Mm. It was all, all made sets at Pinewood. Tomb Raiders, that was another one where I worked on both the Tomb Raider films mm -hmm. and there was Egyptian sets, there was all sorts of sets on that, which was really lovely to do. Um, Alexander the Great, all the Assyrian work on mm -hmm. that I did, it was amazing work to do. There was a 14 foot, I don't know if it's got to it yet, if it's on the second film, there's a 14 foot king with four wings mm -hmm. that I did that um, I had something like two weeks to do that. Our friend Darth Vader's just arrived. Hello. Hello Mr. Vader. <laughs> Please don't use the force. <laughs> nah, now, now I completely forgot what I was going to ask. <laughs> yeah, but you mentioned the museum. Do you, do you have an overview? Do you know which of your original pieces still exist and live in museums where we can see them? Well, the Harry Potter Museum, which yep. is at the studio, a bus to it, mm -hmm. um, you see um, buses coming out from where the station is to the studios every day of every week. That's museum is full and it's amazing mm -hmm. I'm sure people probably even here have been to that uh, museum in uh, Leavesden yeah. where the, um, the museum is but yeah it's got some of my work in there the fact there's two fireplaces the uh, serpent that I talked about that's in there mm -hmm. um, there's the scene where you get the huge trees that are 10 foot across yes. and the, the roots come right, right out. Well, they, they got the, chippers, the carpenters to do um, templates and they wrapped um, thin ply around that and then they applied plaster bark to that, which when it was painted, it looked just like bark. Well, the roots, I, I did all the roots with an, um, another guy mm -hmm. to make it interesting. It makes it believable as a tree. And you get the center running through the tree um, in one scene. But it's amazing the amount of work mm -hmm. that goes into that one set. And again, it, ma it makes it believe it. You believe yep. it's a giant uh, forest with huge trees in. That's the difference between big budget movies. They, they can afford this. And I think it's what, what you mentioned, the, the paintings that might be out of focus in the background, they still make the production value. They still yeah. Yeah. make it look good. So it's, you still see, even though it's not in focus, I think you still see the amount of work yeah. that went into creating these sets. Yeah, I mean, even beyond what we do, our, our work is relatively in the foreground. But yep. you've got the scenic artists that do these amazing backings that will go around mm -hmm. the set, and they really are away in the distance. And, and most of the time, they, they are just totally out of focus. But it actually, again, it makes you think, it makes you. 
Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it makes. We could send you to move the car along. To block. A car is blocking an exit, oh, so right. we could. <laughs> yeah. So it makes you, even though that's way in the background, it makes you believe that your 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 set is going away into infinity, as far as you can see, and it, it it's all part of the uh, magic of film, the film industry, and the. Um, the sets and everything that's done that makes it so believable and of course the actors that make it all work. Yeah. Has there a frage? Yeah, bitte. Yeah. Bitte. Is there a work of you that you are most proud of? Again, I find it <laughs> <laughs> Vader. <laughs> <laughs> We stole me coming in as a close second. <laughs> there was no right way to answer this question, if I'm thinking. <laughs> so, thank you guys all so much for joining us here at Austria Comic Con 2024. And thank you so much for taking time to talk to us. Ladies and gentlemen, Brian Weir! Thank you.